This is Professor Want, and uh, we are here today to discuss digital file storage. Um, I know most of you probably have no idea how files are actually stored on a computer, but in order to get a good understanding of digital forensic evidence, it's important for us to have at least a basic understanding of how a computer works and how it stores information on the hard drive. Uh, at their heart, computers understand, read, and write almost all of their information in binary language. Um, and in binary, the, the meaning of the word binary is that you have two options, on or off, yes or no. For purposes of this presentation, I've represented these two options with two colored circles, red or blue. Each one of these uh, binary circles um, could be either red or blue. They could be either on or off. When you put all the binary digits together, the zeros and ones that float around basically become your data. It's not just enough to have yeses or nos, or ones or zeros. We need to be able to tell a story or, or make a file out of that information. So what computers do is they group sets of these digits together. Each one of these binary digits is, is called a bit. So a bit is represented by one circle on the screen. And when you group four of these bits together, you get a total of 16 combinations. And this is going to be important because as we go through and talk about bits and bytes, um, the base of 16 is extremely important because it's the mathematical combination that much of computing is based off of. Um, so what's important to realize is that when you take four of these bits, when you take four of these yeses or no and put them together, you get a total of 16 different possible combinations. The slide that we're looking here has two scenarios, two of the 16, red, red, blue, blue, red, blue, blue, red. So here we're showing you how um, we could represent two of the 16. But just realize that if you have a total of four, you have a total of 16 different combinations. But when you put eight of them together, when you put eight of these together, uh, you get a combination of 256 different combinations, something that we call one byte. A bit is represented by a single digit by a single bubble, a red or a blue. One byte is eight of these together. And when we put eight of these together, we get 256 possible combinations. And these possible combinations in binary are represented um, with the uh, available options, as we see here on the very bottom, of 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 through 111. 1111, eight zeros, eight ones. And when you change the zeros and the ones backwards and forwards uh, with the eight possible combinations, you get a total of 256 possible combinations that could be re represented by eight single bits in a byte. So, what happens when you take all of these bits and bytes and you put them together um, is you get a programming concept or language or standard that is known as hexadecimal. Uh, hexadecimal is based off of what we call base 16. We've already talked about that if you have four bits, you have 16 possible options, um, 16 possible ways of arranging those bits. So what computer scientists have done is they have assigned a digit or a number to each one of those 16 options, combination options. And what we do is we've actually given each one of them a designation, zero through nine and A through F. So if you were to count um, from lowest to highest in in hexadecimal, you would count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And between 0 through 9 and A through F, you could represent each one of those 16 different ways that you could arrange those four bits um, of your data. Now what's also important to realize about hexadecimal is that they're usually given out in pairs. So you group two groups of four together to make eight. Um, down below what you see here, four groups of two, uh, four groups of two pairs of hexadecimal code, each 0 through 9, and A through F. 
Hexadecimals should look very um, obvious to many people who are network technicians and who work with computers regularly. Uh, hexadecimal are used for, for example, by MAC ID addresses. Um, each individual connection to the internet or portal, such as Wi-Fi or an Ethernet, has a, uh, a hardware address assigned to it called a MAC ID, M-A-C. Uh, the MAC ID has nothing to do with Apple computers or Mac at all. Um, it, it's an an, it's an anagram, um, but Mac uh, IDs are very often represented by hexadecimal, um, as we see here. Um, so your computer has a Mac ID, your connection to the internet, your network card, or your Wi-Fi, um, and you can look it up uh, in your computer in your network settings, and you'll notice that that Mac ID is represented by a hexadecimal um, identifier, as is many things, or as are many things uh, on the computer. Once this data is on our drive, once, this, once we have the data, uh, where are we going to put it? And that's what we're going to go over right now because there are many basic types of storage drives that are available for us. Um, there's the traditional hard drive, which we all know. Uh, hard drives come in two standard sizes. Um, uh, one size meant for desktops, one size really meant for laptops. Uh, there are flash drives. Um, we, most of us have USB thumb drives or flash drives. Um, I would at this point consider them an antiquated technology while many people might consider them an emer uh, a newer or emerging technology. Um, um, and the reason why they're, they're antiquated uh, to me at this point, uh, we'll get to in a second, um, but we also have other antiquated types of technology, such as optical media. Optical media is slowly being phased out, such as CDs and DVDs. We have the, abil the ability to have proprietary disks, such as zip disks, something that people might remember um, from back in the early 2000s uh, and late 1990s. Um, but a lot of these technologies are really being phased out because what, what, what really is in in 2011 uh, when this podcast is being made and what, what we'll be taking over over the next few years are cloud storage. Um, today, uh, the option to host your files uh, on the internet in the cloud uh, is a very good option for some people. Uh, and we need to remember that when conducting digital forensic evidence examinations, that we don't only have to be worried about the hardware uh, that's in the home but or, or in somebody's uh, office, but we also have to be uh, worried about them storing files remotely in the cloud. Um, so let's talk for a second about how the hardware drive or how the storage space works. Um, this is true for hard drives and flash drives uh, and for many proprietary disks. Um, so basically what we have is we have a file storage disk uh, or a container, which is the drive. Um, and then the drive is partitioned, um, which means that we cut the drive into different amounts of space. Um, we then take these partitioned spaces and we format them. When we format them, um, it means that we are making them them writable operating system uses in order to put files on them. Um, so we have a partition, the partition is formatted, uh, and then the files go onto the format. Let's try to represent uh, this, this idea of disks as containers, partitioning and formatting in pictures. Um, and what we're looking here uh, on this slide is a visual representation of a flash drive that has many partitions with different format. The, the flash drive, as we could see um, on the upper left-hand side of the slide, uh, is called the USB flash drive, and it's mounted as a uh, R disk 2. Um, the, the, the flash drive is a total of about uh, 4 gigabytes uh, in total. Um, and what we can see is I partitioned it um, three different ways and left some free space. Um, we have one partition that is 2 gigabytes, and I've called that partition hard drive. I have another partition, which is 1 gigabyte, that I have called data. I have a hidden partition, which is uh, 381 megabytes, and I've called that hidden, um, but it is hidden. Um, and then I have some free space left on the disk as well. What's important to realize here is that when this flash drive is plugged into a computer, the hard drive and the data partitions will both mount and look like two separate drives or two separate disks when really there are one. The hidden volume is set up not to mount automatically, um, but it could contain data that you don't know is there, and unless it's forensically analyzed, you would miss it. It's also very easy to hide data within the free space itself. Um, so just because something isn't partitioned and formatted doesn't mean it can't contain data. One of the top encryption programs on the market, which is called uh, um, free programs on the market, uh, which is called True. Crypt um, makes use of uh, using free space to hide materials at times, so it's hard to prove that encrypted data is there at all. 
This is another view of the same flash drive. I'm using a program called iPartition to see this. Um, and this tells us the total size of the flash drive is just under 4 gigabytes. Um, and it's basically telling me that it's, it's mounted at a mounting point R disk 2. But when you look at the active mounts, the disk mounts, it shows us that it, it's mounting all three. And I have all three open here. The partitioning of a drive uh, uses different schemes. Um, one very common scheme that's used for Windows-based systems is called the master boot record. Uh, for Windows-based uh, uh, schemes, um, it works very well. Uh, and Mac-based schemes, um, the older standard used to be called the Apple partition, uh, but now it's called the GUID partition. This is another example of the same disk, but viewed a different way. On the left, where we see the different colors, blues and grays, um, that is to represent the actual container of the flash drive itself. And then what we can see has been done is we can see that at the very top of that partition, block 0 through 1, is the master boot record, uh, the record uh, that tells the drive how it is partitioned um, and where things go. And then we can see the three separate partitions, um, the hard drive being the biggest, the data, and then the hidden. Um, and we can actually see how the drive has partitioned itself in segments um, just like you could partition a jar full of different color sands um, our hard drive partitions our drive with different segments so that we can fill them with different types of information when it comes to hard drives there are two different types of hard drives um, there are many different types but we're really concerned about regular hard drives versus solid state hard drives traditionally hard drives had moving parts disks or platters which spun Today, the, the goal is to stop having uh, moving parts within computers. Um, it's safer if you drop it and it generates less heat and they're more reliable. So today, um, many of the modern computers use solid state hard drives that have no moving parts at all. Uh, solid state hard drives you, you work a bit like a USB flash drive where you know there are no moving parts, there's nothing spinning, and that it's something that the computer is able to access uh, with low power and low heat production. Uh, we need to be careful and we need to make a decision distinction um, because solid state hard drives um, have caused a lot of um talk in the, in the digital forensic community recently. Um, as it turns out, as we are finding out, you cannot, uh, you cannot digitally analyze a solid state hard drive the same way you've digitally analyzed standard hard drives in the past. Solid state hard drives use very unique architecture and what we're finding is that as solid state hard drives are used and update their own firmware, it's becoming very difficult for a digital forensic evidence analyst to be able to analyze them using traditional techniques. Uh, this podcast is being made in um, April of 2011 and today um, researchers around the world are trying to find new ways to analyze as solid state hard drives um, with digital forensic evidence technique because the current techniques simply are not sufficient. If a criminal is using a solid state hard drive that has been wiped or that has been firmware upgraded, a digital forensic uh, expert might have a really hard time piecing things back together again uh, in the end. We all know about USB flash drives. They're extremely common. They were uh, originally known as thumb drives. Um, they contain solid state non volatile memory that um, could be uh, written, to, written and read to and from. Uh, when you unplug it from the computer, you don't lose the memory. They're inexpensive. Um, you could buy lots of storage right now for very cheap. Uh, you know, you can buy a four gigabyte flash drive for ten dollars or less at this point um, so the cost of storage is is, is coming down significantly uh, and as you can see by the pictures they come in a variety of shapes and sizes they come disguised as a hamburger or a watermelon or a Darth Vader or an R2D2 um, and it is your responsibility to be able or the digital forensic experts responsibility to be able to identify all these different objects and uh, understand the value that they might contain we also have to worry about optical media and proprietary disks. They are fading away slowly. They're still used for backup. They were heavily relied on um, in the 90s and early 2000s. But what we're really talking about are CDs, DVDs, mini disks, SD cards, uh, flash drives, zip drives. There's a whole bunch of different things out there. Uh, but what's important to remember is that there are lots of options. There are lots of places digital media could exist. You know, how do you know a person didn't hide a stolen Excel spreadsheet on the internal memory of their digital camera? You don't. You don't until you go and you analyze it. And in many cases, you might have to go and analyze it. It's something that is important to realize uh, if you're out there in the field. Digital disks, optical disks, and proprietary disks are slowly fading away because of the really cheap cost of solid state and cloud storage. Most technically adept people today will already be using cloud storage, but chances are you might not. Um, 
cloud storage is the future for everyone, but it's the present for people like me and others who understand the value of cloud storage, um, but understand that there are security trade-offs that need to be considered. Cloud storage is a fancy way of saying your files or operating system or programs are stored on the internet, not on your local hard drive. Many programs such as Dropbox um, might sync your files to your local hard drive, but ultimately they're being stored in secure cloud storage facilities that won't be um, subject to things like nuclear destruction or um, large-scale disaster or hacking because your files are existing in multiple places at multiple times in multiple data centers spread out throughout the world. Cloud storage is safe, but the trade-off is that there is a possibility that a hacker or social engineer could get to these files and compromise them in some way. Um, there are secure methods of using cloud storage. Um, however, I wouldn't store my most sensitive files in the cloud today. However, However, as the technology progresses, maybe one day I will decide to do so, but others are already doing so. Cloud storage is pretty safe today in April of 2011, and it will only get safer as time moves on. If you're using um, programs like Gmail or Hotmail or AOL email, you are already using cloud storage to host your files. If you're using Google Docs or MobileMe, you're already using cloud storage. And I suggest and encourage all of you to go look at um, what I think is one of the forerunners in cloud storage storage, which is a program called Dropbox, which is available at dropbox.com. Dropbox is a, um, a, a third-party company that uses the Amazon cloud storage to keep your files in the cloud and synced onto your computer, ultimately creating a version-by-version -version library of all of your files that could never be destroyed, um, you know, subject uh, apocalypse, you know, without an apocalypse occurring or something like that. So that's kind of what we wanted to go over in, in file cloud storage. If you have questions um, or comments, um, address them to the weekly discussion board.